Hello everybody, Jeremy Dickinson here. Thank you all for watching. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Philosophy Clips. In this philosophy clip, I'll be talking about John Arthur's response to Peter Singer on the issue of world poverty. I'll be using Arthur's classic essay, Famine Relief and the Ideal Moral Code, for those of you interested in following or having a read uh, of your own. Now, let's just um, set the stage by talking about Singer's solution uh, and then turn our attention to Arthur's response. So Singer, he, according to many, has a quite extreme or radical proposal to solving the problem of extreme poverty. So extreme poverty is the kind of poverty that someone is in if that someone lacks the resources to meet his or her um, basic needs. Of course, it's applied to families as well. So um, um, a family can be extremely impoverished when it lacks the resources to meet its basic needs. So that's the kind of poverty that we're interested in in this video. And Singer, his strategy involves thinking about um, uh, what our moral obligations are to those who are in this devastating condition of extreme poverty. Um, he's, at least for my purposes, for our purposes, is dealing with the moral issue, not the sort of legal coercive issue, but what we're morally obligated to do, what an individual's moral responsibility is to help those who are in that uh, extremely impoverished state. Now, um, Singer, he advances a principle that Arthur recognizes and that other recognize, others recognize in the singer, um, that singer uses to advance his solution. So the principle is called the greater moral evil principle. I believe Arthur refers to it as a greater moral evil rule. Um, I'll call it GMEP, the greater moral evil principle. And according to it, um, it goes like this. Um, if one can prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance, then all things being equal, one ought to do it. I'll say that again just so we're clear. GMEP, the greater moral evil principle, if one can prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance, then all things being equal, one ought to do it. And Singer thinks that this principle will go a long way towards establishing the claim that people, you and I, um, have um, pretty significant obligations, or I should say very significant obligations to those who are extremely impoverished. So the idea would be that we can prevent um, bad things from happening um, without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable uh, moral significance or comparable moral worth um, by um, donating um, our excesses, our luxuries, to charity organizations, for example, um, in order to prevent the deaths of those who are extremely impoverished. So the, the bad that we can prevent from occurring is the deaths of those who are extremely impoverished. And at every step, it's always going to be um, the sacrifice of something that's non-basic. It's going to be sacrifice of a luxury. Now, Singer is definitely not committed to the idea that what we need to do in every circumstance is be donating to charity organizations. So he's targeting uh, in some of his writings um, uh, uh, people who are just inclined to help those who are extremely impoverished by donating, say, monthly to a charity organization. There are other ways um, that um, one could go about um, uh, solving the problem of, of extreme poverty, and Singer's well aware of that. Again, the audience here is key that he is uh, trying to reach. Moreover, Singer does think that the efforts to um, alleviate uh, extreme poverty um, um, need to be sustainable. So it's not that Singer is claiming that, um, that we just need to throw money at the problem. That's definitely not his problem. It has to, whatever our solution is, it has to be sustainable. It just turns out that um, resources and m money Right. They are needed in order to save the extremely impoverished, and so that's like a first step. But of course, um, there's a lot of um, thinking about the details. So it's where the philosopher 
and the work of the philosopher can um, can engage with the work of say policymakers, you know, those who are um, at the ground level um, or just above the ground level who are trying to figure out how it is that we're going to implement what the um, the theories the the argue the philosophical arguments establish. And so you think about Singer as someone who's doing that heavy lifting from the philosophical perspective and then recognizing that what has to be done from there is engaging with social scientists, policy makers, and then people who are obviously on the ground who would be doing the relevant work. Of course, it's perfectly consistent with what Singer's saying that you and I do what we can. We you know get off our duffs and go and take care of the extremely impoverished. And so, so again, I don't think that we should um, take um, Singer's solution as involving the sacrifice of everything but our basic needs to help the extremely impoverished as um, being the only way and um, being um, simplistic because you know Singer's thought very carefully about this and recognizes that we do have to engage with again the social scientists and the policy makers on how best to in a sustainable way um, curb and alleviate eliminate extreme poverty as much as we can so um, Arthur is aware of that as well. Arthur is certainly not going to set up a straw man to try to take down uh, Peter Singer. So he takes down, or tries to take down Peter Singer anyway, uh, Peter Singer's solution anyways, by way of challenging that principle, GMEP. So the way I like to understand Arthur is there's really two stages um, of responding to GMEP. The first stage is to think about GMEP in the context of the actual moral code that we have um, so um, we can all agree that there's a moral code that we roughly live by. Now, of course, individually, we might have differences with respect to our individual uh, moral codes, but broadly speaking, in our society, we have a moral code um, that admits of quite a bit of overlap um, between you know, thinking about all the um, particular moral codes that are out there. So. And we don't have to work out the idea of a moral code, um, you know, so so perfectly in order to appreciate how it is that Arthur is going to challenge GMEP. Um, just be thinking about the fact that there seems to be something like a moral code that we have. Of course, that moral code that we actually have is one that could be improved upon. It could be revised. It could be changed. No doubt, it um, frequently does undergo change over time. That's all. Can, that, that all can be agreed upon by. All sides here can be agreed upon by Arthur, by Singer, you and I. And so that's not really an issue. So just be thinking about the idea of a moral code. And what Arthur wants to say is let's think about GMEP in relationship to the actual moral code that we have. And what Arthur wants us to see is straight away that GMEP is incompatible with our um, actual moral code, meaning it's not in there. I mean, we have principles like don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, and don't kill as part of our moral code. We also have more positive um, moral principles like help others when they're in need, um, you know, give to charity, et cetera, et cetera, in our actual moral code. Um, but we're not going to find when we sort of examine it line by line, if, if we could, we're not going to find GMEP itself. We're not going to find the principle that if one can prevent something bad from happening without thereby uh, sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance, then all things being equal, one ought to do it. We're not going to find that in there. Um, and Arthur um, knows why it's not in there. You know, it's because we think that we have um, we have entitlements. We have the rights to things that we've justly attained, obtained. We have the the rights to the um, to the fruits of our labor, as it were, if I can put it put in that kind of way. So we have um, entitlements, and entitlements count against um, GMEP having the <clears throat> the kind of um, generality that Singer would claim that it has. So um, what Arthur wants to claim in order really to drive home how GMEP is incompatible with the actual moral code is just by thinking about the implications of GMEP. If GMEP is true, then it looks like, I'm gonna just modify one of Arthur's examples here. Um, if there were someone who were 
you know, at your local hospital who needed um, a kidney, then, um, and, and it turned out that you were the perfect match for it, the only match, um, the only one who could say, the only one who could save the life of the individual who needs your kidney, then it looks like, it, supposing you have two kidneys in good working order, it looks like then GMAP's going to imply, all things being equal, that you better hightail it over to the, uh, to the hospital and donate that um, kidney. And what Arthur wants to say is, that's absurd. Okay, um, you don't have that obligation. It'd be nice of you. Uh, it would be uh, saintly of you, perhaps, to do such a thing, but it certainly isn't a moral obligation. It certainly isn't part of our actual moral code that you head to the hospital once you find out that someone is dying and is in need of your particular kidney in order to survive. <clears throat> so thinking about how GMAP would work in that case, you could prevent something um, bad from happening, namely the death of the individual who needs your kidney, without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance. Hey, you've got two in good working order, so you wouldn't, you'd be fine. Um, your life might be compromised a little bit, but, um, but still, it's your life being compromised a little bit versus right, death. So um, then it looks like GMAP's going to predict, all things being equal, that you donate your kidney, but that seems to be the wrong result. Now, Arthur, so that really, let me just say, that, that concludes um, the, the first step in responding to GMAP. But um, Singer, he responds, and Arthur anticipates um, the, um, the response by Singer. Um, I actually have Singer's, one of Singer's papers, um, one of his earliest discussions of, of uh, world poverty. It's called Famine, Affluence, and Morality. You can readily find this online as well if you're interested. And uh, the original article on page 558, um, Singer, he lays out the idea that um, he's um, well aware of the fact that uh, GMEP is not a uh, part of our actual moral code, but that's no knock against it, uh, because what Singer's up to is revising the actual moral code and revising it in such a way as to improve it. So Singer is a revisionist about ethics in this way. He's a revisionist about our moral code in this way. And so he would want to claim, here's how I like to put it, and here's how Arthur would understand it. Um, GMEP, the greater moral evil principle, is part of our ideal moral code. Okay, it's part of the ideal moral code that we would have. Okay, where are we to improve our moral code? So, um, so Singer says this. <clears throat> so I'll just read a quick passage, if you'll follow along with me. Um, Singer notes, again on page 558 of the original article, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, by Peter Singer. Quote, it may still be thought that my conclusions are so wildly out of line with what everyone else thinks think about the extreme or radical nature of his conclusion in the world poverty debate, and has always thought that there must be something wrong with the argument somewhere. In order to show that my conclusions, his solution, while certainly contrary to contemporary Western moral standards, okay, while certainly contrary to our actual moral code, um, would not have seemed so extraordinary at other times and in other places. I would like to quote a passage from a writer not normally thought of as a way out radical, Thomas Aquinas. So those of you who don't know, say Thomas Aquinas, uh, he was a 13th century Italian philosopher, um, one of the um, um, medieval philosophers that you would study in a medieval philosophy course. Um, he's um, he's a writing in the Christian tradition and heavily influenced uh, Christian theology. Um, so here's the quote from St. Thomas Aquinas that Singer um, notes. So now, according to the natural order instituted by divine providence, that is God, material goods are provided for the satisfaction of human needs. Therefore, the division and appropriation of property which proceeds from human law must not hinder the satisfaction of man's necessity from such goods. And here's really the kicker. Equally, whatever a man has in superabundance, whatever he has in luxury, is owed of natural right to the poor for their sustenance. So Ambrosius, and is also to be found in the Decretium Gratiani, the bread which you withhold belongs to the hungry, the clothing you shut away to the naked, 
and the money you bury in the earth or put in the bank is the redemption and freedom of the penniless. So that's a passage from St. Thomas Aquinas. And what's interesting here is Singer, um, he's a professed atheist. Um, Aquinas is definitely not. He is in the theistic tradition. But interestingly, they have similar views when it comes to the needy, when it comes to taking care of those who um, lack their basic needs. So what St. Thomas Aquinas here is saying is it's a natural right that people have their material needs satisfied. And so when people have extra, then they ha- they're obligated to give some of their extra away to help those who are um, extremely impoverished, we can put it that way. And so what um, Singer is saying is, look, I don't have to accept the theology, but I still think that um, Aquinas is right. And keep in mind, we have an actual moral code, which is inconsistent with GMEP. But someone like St. Thomas Aquinas, who's working in the Christian tradition, is just reminding people, look, there are moral codes, as it were, which are perfectly compatible with GMEP. So it's not as if, you know, GMEP is that outlandish. It's outlandish maybe in how we've evolved, you know, contemporary, as he puts it, in the contemporary uh, Western world. Um, But that's no necessary knock against it. So... Singer's ultimately then an interesting, you know, um, ally with St. Thomas Aquinas on this incites him. And what Singer can really say is like, look, my view is revisionist. And you might even be able to say, 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 excuse me, say something like, I'm a revivalist. Like I'm reviving an idea that, um, uh, that is no longer taken seriously nowadays, but once was. And there's a little bit of a, you know, the Western world is, um, its moral standards are um, based somewhat, maybe in large part, on Christian values, Judeo-Christian values. St. St. Thomas Aquinas is expressing those here. And there's a bit of Singer, as it were, kind of reminding, I think, you know, the Western world that he's writing to, like, look, this is, this is, I'm defending a view that's really part of um, um, the religious tradition that's been central to the formation of our moral standards here. Maybe we've forgotten. Um, again, Singer doesn't endorse the theology, um, but it looks like he wants to endorse uh, the morality. So let's turn back to Arthur, because now the issue is whether or not um, whether or not GMEP would be part of an ideal moral code. And um, Arthur uh, claims no. So this is the second step where Arthur says um, GMEP, the greater moral evil principle, it would not even be part of an ideal moral code. And that would be the sort of the last step that challenges Singer, Singer's claiming that, that GMEP would be long as a part of an ideal moral code. And Arthur provides reasons to say the contrary. Now, the big picture, here's what Arthur is saying here. He's saying, look, um, when we think about a moral code, we should be thinking about what its purpose is. And its purpose is in part to guide the behavior of um, the individuals who are adhering to it, of course. Um, but it's also there to play a role in, in enhancing the well-being levels of those who are adhering to the moral code. So it should be the case, all things being equal, that people who are living up to the moral code, their well-being levels are, are being improved accordingly there's you know a lot that could be said here but just maybe just note that there's long uh, there's 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 a view that um, that's been held in the history of philosophy for a long time it's even held to this day that there's a connection between you're living as you should morally and your life going well for you um, there may not be a perfect connection between them but there's a rough connection between them and that's something that you know Arthur is just um, developing here and paying some service to look all things being equal, and when people follow a moral code, it should make their lives go better. Not in every circumstance, of course, but just generally speaking. And what Arthur wants to claim is, let's, let's think about GMAP. Would it on balance, would it on balance improve the well-being levels of those who live up to it, or of those who have it uh, in their moral code more exactly? So if we were to imagine an ideal moral code, we've got GMAP in it, just for argument's sake, what would follow? And 
um, if it turns out that having GMEP in the ideal moral code would count negatively against our well-being levels, then um, according to Arthur, GMEP does not belong in the ideal moral code. It doesn't belong in the actual one. It's not there. Okay, it doesn't belong in the ideal moral code. Those are the two options. So GMEP, we can go ahead and dismiss. And Singer's solution to world poverty fails. That's the strategy. So how does Arthur argue against um, GMEP? Well, there's a passage here I'll read again, so if you'll follow along with me. This is on page 568 of the Arthur in the original article. So he writes, more precisely, quote, more precisely, were the moral code to expect such saintliness, three results would likely follow. First, since few live up to the rules, the rules that would be generated from GMAP, people would feel guilty. Second, the code would encourage conflict between those who meet these moral expectations and those who do not. And finally, a realistic code that doesn't demand too much might actually result in more giving. Consider the following analogy. People might actually buy less candy if they are permitted to buy it occasionally, but are praised for spending on other things. Then if they are prohibited from buying candy altogether, think about prohibition, what prohibition tends to do. We cannot assume that making what is now treated as charity into a moral requirement will always encourage such behavior. But by giving people the right to keep their property, you're praising those who do not exercise that, the right but help others instead. We have found a good balance. End quote. So big picture, three things um, that Arthur is identifying here. First, um, an ideal moral code. Um, it's got to be one that contributes to our well-being. Now let's consider GMAP as part of that ideal moral code. For argument's sake, what's going to happen if GMAP is true? Well, people are going to feel guilty because GMAP is hard to live up to. right? Being in such a state or being such that you have to follow a principle that tells you that whenever you can prevent evil from occurring without sacrificing anything of, of comparable, moral, comparable moral significance and you ought to do it, that's pretty demanding. Um, it's going to create resentment among those who are living up to the moral code, ultimately. Um, and then he goes on to say, um, I, beyond this passage here, uh, he wants to say that um, GMEP would ultimately disincline people to work, disincline people to work hard because they'd be thinking, well, I've got to give most of it away anyway, most of the fruits of my work away anyway. So so uh, typically work is, is, is associated with getting resources, luxuries, which improves your life. And then, um, then he wants to just make this further claim that um, having principles and ideal moral code that are I don't know, easier to live up to uh, make it more likely that people live up to the relevant principles. Um, so... Those three uh, main considerations, four really, um, if you add that last one, um, add up to um, an argument that GMEP would count against all things being equal, the well-being levels of um, individuals who are supposed to live up to it. Um, so GMEP does not belong to an ideal moral code. We already saw it doesn't belong to an actual moral code, so we conclude that GMEP is false. And Singer, Singer's arguments, which rely on it in order to develop his solution to world poverty, fail as well. So hopefully that's clear. If you have any questions about the Arthur, the singer, uh, please comment below. Let me know. Uh, thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.